ABC Wednesdays. Y'all can play all day. We want books. We want paper towels in the classroom. Bet you want raises, too. I'm Honey. still waiting on the paper towels. Abbott Elementary returns with the new season. We asked the district for more after-school programs. They gave us $50 for class pets instead. Critics cheer. Abbott Elementary continues to be one of the funniest and most beloved shows on TV. What y'all doing out there? Taking bribes. Proud of y'all. Abbott Elementary, Wednesdays, 9.30, 8.30 Central on ABC and stream on Hulu. (coughs) Stop. (coughs) Stop. (coughs) Stop. Had enough? Kick out mucus and quiet the cough with Mucinex 12-Hour DM for long-lasting cough and chest congestion relief. Buy Mucinex 12-Hour DM at your local retailer. Use as directed. This episode is brought to you by Shopify. Upgrade your business with Shopify, home of the number one checkout on the planet. Shop Pay boosts conversions up to 50%, meaning fewer carts going abandoned and more sales going cha-ching. So if you're into growing your business, get a commerce platform that's ready to sell wherever your customers are. Visit Shopify.com to upgrade your selling today. Age of Radio. Hello there, folks, and thank you for listening to the show. I'm Joanna. I'm Nate, and this is Stranger Than. This time, we have two stories for you, both having to do with the sea. So that's a nice little uh, theme we got going on today. Yes. Although the stories are not particularly nice, either of them. I mean, mine's not so bad, but it's weird, a little gross at times. Why don't we uh, mix things up a bit, Joanna, and we can uh, start with yours. Oh, I get to start this time? You can start this time. Okay. Well, I am going to tell you guys about the Salish Sea feet mystery. So the Salish Sea is a sea that's around where I am, right? The Salish Sea is a marginal sea of the Pacific Ocean. And it is located in the Canadian province of British Columbia and the state of Washington in the United States. And it basically uh, is the name of the body of water that is the Puget Sound, the Strait of Juan de Fuca, and the Strait of Georgia collectively. So basically the northwestern part of the Pacific Ocean in 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 the United States and the southwestern part of the Pacific in Canada. Yes. So it's the Pacific Ocean, but it's kind of separate from like the rest of the ocean because it's kind of in, in like this inlet. Yeah, yeah. And since 2007, from 2007 to the most recent uh, occurrence in 2019, 21 feet have washed ashore between right yeah yeah most in shoes uh you know between british columbia and uh areas of washington state basically the all up and down the coastline of the salish sea my sources for this are wikipedia simply because it was nice to put everything in a nice orderly fashion as to the uh, dates of the occurrences and locations. And then also uh, George Takai's show, The Terror. He, He did a special episode of it on this particular phenomena. Interesting. Now to quote good old George Takai, R.I.P., strange might be called normal for the Pacific Northwest. A place of the dark, where things that haunt us fester and thrive. Do they now? I think they do. I mean, I'd say they, yeah. That is a place of the dark. Not it that is, I yeah. Live I mean, not in the dark as much. Yeah, I mean, that's what happens when you get closer up north, is it's dark longer mm-hmm. in the winter and it's light longer in the summer. Yes. I was more than happy to give up. Uh, a little bit less light in the summer to have more of it in the winter. It makes a difference. It's been a long time since I've 
experienced that, so I don't remember. Yeah. Yeah, I I had had it with the dark. Yeah. I had enough. Dark just dark. like my soul. Right. <laughs> like the soul of many in the Pacific Northwest. Like the coffee we drink. Yes. First occurrence was on August 20th, 2007 on Jedediah Island, British Columbia. A girl visiting from Washington picked up a size 12 Adidas shoe, opened the sock to find out it contained a man's right foot. That would fucking creep me out. It's like, oh, a shoe. Oh, a foot. Yes. Now, eventually, the remains were identified as a man missing, name withheld at the family's request, but he was suffering from depression, so it's thought to be a suicide. August 26, just six days later, at Gabriola Island, British Columbia, a man's right foot was discovered by a couple. It appeared to have been taken ashore by an animal... And it was a, the shoe was a size 12 white right Reebok. And nothing more was learned of the foot or the owner of the foot. Now, it's important to emphasize that these feet mostly all appear to be disarticulated, meaning they were part of a body that decomposed in the water and the feet came off of the body. Likely because, I mean, shoes float? Yeah, so shoes float, and that's why they, you know, tend to find just the, the feet, but um, they weren't, like, chopped off. So a lot of people think that they were severed in some way, but... Technically, they were disarticulated. They just came off while the body was decomposing or whatever. Exactly. February 8th, 2008, a right foot was found in a size 11 Nike on Valdez Island, British Columbia. It was identified as a 21-year-old man who was reported missing four years prior, so back in 2004. Now, the man's left foot would be found on June 16th, 2008, in Weston Island, British Columbia. On May 22nd, 2008, a woman's right foot was found on Kirkland Island, British Columbia. And by the shoes and maybe later on some other evidence, it was thought to be the foot of a woman who had jumped into the water off the uh, Petulo Bridge in New Westminster in April of 2004. So a suicide victim. Her other foot would be found on November 11th, 2008 in Richmond, British Columbia. On August 1st, 2008, in Washington State, a right foot was found inside a man's black size 11 shoe, discovered by a camper on the beach. October 22nd, 2009, the right foot in a size 8.5 Nike running shoe was found on a beach in Richmond, British Columbia. This one was re was identified as coming from a Vancouver area man who was reported missing in January 2008. August 27, 2010, Woodby Island, Washington, a woman or child's right foot without a shoe or sock was discovered. Someone walking around on Whidbey Island and like do 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 do. Oh, here's a fucking foot on the beach. Yeah, and. Here's a frickin' human foot. It was estimated the foot had been in the water about two months. It was tested for DNA, DNA, but no match was found in the National DNA Database. December 5th, 2010. A right foot still inside a boy's size 6, size six Ozark Trail hiking boot was found in Tacoma, Washington. 
August 30th, 2011, False Creek, British Columbia, a foot of a unknown gender was found in a man's white blue size 9 running shoe. This one still had the lower leg bones attached to the foot. Jesus. November 4th, 2011. In Sassamut Lake, British Columbia, a man's right foot inside a size 12 hiking boot was discovered by a group of campers. The man was identified as a fisherman who had gone missing in 1987. Wow. Yes. I thought that was very strange. Normally things will... I mean, it's the ocean. Yeah. It's salt water. There's tons of critters in there. 1987. Found in 2011. Just yeah. the one foot in the hiking shoe. December 10th, 2011. Lake Union, Seattle. Human leg, and bone, and a foot in a black plastic bag was found under the Ship Canal Bridge. That seems a little uh, suspect there, in a black plastic bag. Yeah, that one does seem pretty sus to me. Uh, yeah. The medical examiner could not determine a cause of death or identify who the leg and foot belonged to. January 26, 2012, Vancouver, British Columbia. Human bones inside a boot were found in the sand. No cause of death, no identity revealed. This episode is brought to you by Shopify. Upgrade your business with Shopify, home of the number one checkout on the planet. Shop pay boosts conversions up to 50%, meaning fewer carts going abandoned and more sales going cha-ching. So if you're into growing your business, get a commerce platform that's ready to sell wherever your customers are. Visit Shopify.com to upgrade your selling today. I imagine it's pretty hard to tell a cause of death by just finding a foot. I mean, there's no organs mm -hmm. in there. and It's been in the water for a long time. Or, I mean, it's just, it's not freezing. Like it's a foot. It used to belong. It's a person's foot. Yeah, that's a human foot. That is a human foot right there. It's fucking and look, wild. Uh, and, uh, and so the sneakers are New Balance, size 12. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, that's all you can find. I mean, you know more about the actual shoe than they do the, the person who was wearing the shoe. Right. I suppose if it was actually, if you could see where it had actually been severed or something, then you could assume that the cause of death was homicide. Yeah. But yeah, when, like in the when plastic it's just bag. a when it's just a disarticulated foot, it could be, was it accidental? Was it suicide? Yeah, it could have been it could have been anything. It could have been homicide too. You just can't always tell by the foot. And people don't generally take their uh toe prints when, you know, at all. No. <laughs> there's no there's no. no toe print file. Maybe there should be a toe print file. I mean, you can probably extract DNA from the bones, but No, yeah, like from yeah, probably. But then, you know, unless their DNA is in the system. Yeah. And you you could tell to, uh, basic else information. To identify. You can tell yeah. male or female. They can tell, you know, certain genetic things, but not really like, oh, they were shot in the chest. You know, that's just I can not going to show up. By the appearance of the foot, yeah. clearly. May 6, 2014, Seattle, Washington. A human foot in a white New Balance shoe found along the shoreline of Centennial Park near Pier 86. February 7th, 2016, Vancouver Island, British Columbia. Hikers on Botanical Beach found a foot in a sock in a running shoe. December 8th, 2017, Vancouver Island, British Columbia. Remains with a leg and a shoe attached, washed up on the shore of the Jordan River on Vancouver Island. May 6, 2018, Gabriola Island, British Columbia. Hiking boots with a human foot inside, wedged in a log jam. September of 2018, West Vancouver, British Columbia. 
A foot found in a size nine and a half shoe. Believed to be worn by a male. Under 50. Also, blue sock. All right. <laughs> one shoe, one blue sock, one foot. Believed to be male under the age of 50. The thing about the shoes is all of these shoes are they're not special. You know, you can't just find out by tracing who bought the shoes because New Balance, Nike, Adidas, people buy that shit all the time. Those are huge companies. The most you can trace is when it was manufactured, which right. is here actually in some of the Wikipedia list, but I'm just not, you know. Right. It doesn't really seem pertinent. <laughs> no, not so much. The last foot that has been found on the coastline of the Salish Sea would be January 1st, 2019. Foot found in a boot later identified to a missing man who'd been missing since December of 2016. It was found in a boot, found on, get this, Jetty Island, Everett in Washington. Wow. The place we almost went to for Beach Day right, a couple right. of months ago. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> Who the fuck goes to Jetty Island on January 1st? I don't know. Maybe New Year's Day. Like, I mean, yeah, it's it's, a nice nobody place. lives there. You have to take a ferry, like a special like boat thing over to that island. Like, it just doesn't seem like it would be a nice day to do that. Well, maybe, to be outdoors I mean, on the beach on yeah, January 1st. If you want to go for a crisp walk. I guess. I usually just don't want area. to go in the water, you know, by the water on the beach unless it's like, Swim time. Yeah, but it's still, I mean, it'd still be a nice a nice walk. You know, you get to see the water, and there's probably not a lot of people there, which is pretty cool. Yeah, I guess. I don't know. That's more like, I want to be inside, under blankets. <laughs> Nursing the hangover. Nursing the hangover, <laughs> reading a book, watching TV. Something like that. Yeah. So, yeah, all in all, 21. And of those 21, there's two pairs found. And now, when was the last one found? January 2019. So it's been a couple of years. It's been a couple of years. But maybe it's just because of the pandemic. People haven't been out looking for feet. Yeah. Probably not. Maybe people aren't out accidentally drowning or drowning themselves as much who knows yeah now there's been all sorts of crazy ideas as to like what's going on with the feet because that's a lot of fucking feet that's, that's I mean, a goodly eight, amount of feet eight eight of the feet were identified belonging to six individuals because they found two complete sets of feet but never did they find them, like, next to one another. They was always... No, it was always separate, in separate locations. Months apart. Months apart. Of, yeah, months apart. And so six people out of the 21 feet. And since there was, like, two pairs... I don't know. I suck at math. But there, there's still a whole lot of unidentified feet out there. Let's yes. just say that. Yes. Without me having to think too hard here. Now, they say there's a perfectly rational explanation for this. It is not alien abductions, the Yakuza. Yakuza? The Yakuza, yeah. It is not a serial killer. Although, I mean... We don't have serial killers anymore. That you know of. They, they, we don't have serial killers anymore. They, they get caught so fast. They can't, <laughs> you can't get away with shit anymore. Not for a very long time. Unless you got a bunch of money. Right. I don't know. People, I think there, there's still people out there getting away with some stuff. They're just tapping into populations where people just don't give a fuck and don't connect the dots. And uh, That could well be the case. Yeah. Don't investigate it very thoroughly. We don't have serial killers anymore like we did in the 70s and 80s. Right, where it's just like indiscriminately picking whoever. The Night Stalker yeah. and fucking Ted Bundy and all those pieces of shit. 
Gary Ridgway. Now he yeah. got away from it for a really long time because he was, uh, you know, picking from a population of people that are just. No one gave a shit about. Yeah, yeah. exactly. And also, but I mean, a lot of it was also the technology at the time. There weren't cameras fucking everywhere. They did mm-hmm. not have the ability to use. They didn't have the forensics they have in it now. Yeah. I mean, it's just, if you're going to get away with that, you're going to have to do it in a place where, like, just killing homeless people or, you know, a, a population of people that people don't give a fuck about and doing it someplace where it's not bothering the people that people do give a fuck about. Yeah, and it's not homeless. It's unhoused, okay? Unhoused, whatever. <laughs> They're not killing, you know, the destitute. Or they are killing the destitute, if they're even out there. Yeah. I mean, who knows? Well, there's, I mean... The, I mean there's a, a large amount of people that the there's government There's a large amount of people that go about. missing every year. Oh, yeah. Look at how many goddamn feet of washed ashore they haven't been able to identify. Fair enough. Fair enough. <laughs> So, yeah, no Yakuza, no serial killer, no alien abductions. They simply think, the experts, authorities, simply think that because there are 7 million people who live somewhere on the coastline of the Salish Sea, that there's just, like, a whole lot of bodies that are in the Salish Sea because of accidental drownings and suicides. And because... uh, the, decom- the decomposition process speeds up in the water, and then the feet detach quite easily, and the buoyancy of the shoes, which apparently get more buoyant, uh, you know, the more recently that they are made. Oh, yeah, because there's less natural materials in them. Yeah. They make them really easily, they really easily float to shore, and also, because the winds blow primarily from west to east, it, it moves those little floating shoes with foot bonies in them right onto the shore. It makes it easy for them to wash ashore and well, be and found by people. also tides and shit. Mm-hmm. It's just odd, because, I mean, this has captured, like, national, even, like, worldwide attention. Yeah. So you would think that there must be other parts of the world where that has, like, kind of the same currents or wind direction or something i mean why why isn't this happening in other and like you know other places where it's just like tons of like disarticulated feet wash ashore and it's not it's only happening in the happening in the sailor sea as far as i know i have not found any other mass uh you know disarticulated findings. feet findings anywhere else yeah. it's just it's really strange it's and uh, I mean, why? Why 2007? Why did it? Why is it happening like so on the regular since 2007? Yeah, I mean that's why pretty strange. All of you a would sudden, expect I that. mean, I get that the 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 shoes get more buoyant, but yeah, but you, I mean, still, it's, it's still it's just like yeah. Ever since I'm, 2007, it's the longest it's gone has been like maybe two years. I mean, I remember that. I remember living back there, you know, back in Washington several years ago, and just like, oh man, they found another foot. <laughs> like, yeah, I remember hearing fuck? about that too. Yeah, yeah, it was like every other day. It seemed like they were finding a goddamn foot somewhere. It's fucking wild. Yeah. So, uh, they, you know, they, I get where some of the explanations, like, yeah, that, that makes sense. But also, it's still really weird. Yeah, because what was so special about 2007? It wasn't like there was a huge change in shoe manufacturing from 2006 to 2007, where suddenly everything was more buoyant. I mean, right. the yeah. same materials were basically being used the whole time. Yeah. So... I mean, I can understand how maybe you're not going to find any in the 1950s when shoes were made of, like, something real that would sink right. or, you know, whatever. Except but, for that one guy from 1987. Yeah, yeah. But even still, in the 80s, shoes were fucking synthetic as shit, too. Yeah. So it's weird that there was one that the guy was lost in 87. And for the foot to have survived that long. Mm-hmm. That. I'm I'm sorry. That was definitely an alien abduction. <laughs> yeah. 
I mean, the it's the the shoe both protects the foot from decomposition and transports it to shore. But I mean, nineteen eighty seven. Yeah, yeah, no. That was definitely alien. I mean, how do they know it wasn't alien abduction? I mean, how are they ruling that out? I know, right? I don't know how they rule that out exactly. Only that they are just trying to give reasons as to why this, you know, might not be as crazy as one might think. But this is, I mean, I don't, I don't know. know. I it's think it's still weird. Pretty fucking crazy. I, I mean, think it's weird. And so they don't really, I mean, they just think it's a freak occurrence that people who are. And so many feet and they never found the bodies of any of these, you know, owners of the feet. And they like, only found six of the people who belonged to the feet? Yes. I mean, there was 19 different people's feet because yes. there was two two people, right. both feet were found. So yeah, both 19. feet were found. So, so yeah. that's six people were identified. So there's 13 people out there missing a foot. Yes. At least a foot. Between and Canada and Washington. Yeah, and between Canada and Washington, yeah. That's, uh... And, I mean, Canada's big, Washington, you know, I mean, Washington's big, Canada's bigger, but we're talking about a very... But it's in very, Vancouver. Yeah, or in British it, Columbia, we're talking rather. about, like, a pretty, um, you know, specific area. Oh, yeah. And I'm sure you're not finding a lot of people's feet from, like, Ohio or, or Saskatchewan in the Pacific Ocean. No. Because that's fairly far from the Pacific Ocean. But they don't have they they don't really. Which have is any... why I think they were thinking of the yakuza. Um, that's why that theory came up that like maybe it was coming all the way from Japan. But they're just like nah. Yeah, I mean, I guess I mean Japan is fairly close to the west coast of North America. I I, I guess I mean. You'd think that maybe Hawaii... It's closer than on the East Coast. <laughs> it's closer to the... Than, yeah, but it's still... I mean, you, you couldn't take a It's still a, a fair amount, but there. I mean, yeah, yeah just... And you'd uh, think that maybe a few feet would get stuck up on Hawaii on the way over or something, right. you that's know? A, that's or, an awful long journey for that foot to, yeah, to take in, yeah. its, in its little buoyant shoe, you know, floating along in its shoe. But they don't really have any, I mean, they just, no. they're just like, I don't know, there's fucking feet, guys. Here's just, all the reasons why this isn't so crazy, but... Like, we're not going to do anything about it. Yeah. I don't know. Like, this isn't a big deal, everyone, when I'm kind of like, yeah, I don't know. That's, like, I feel like that's kind of a big deal. I feel like it is, too. <laughs> I mean, if I were to lose my foot, I would want them to find me. Right. Just find the rest of me. <laughs> right. I mean, the, yeah. Fucking weird. Lewis friend, find the rest of me. Yeah. Sounds of the lambs. Remember? Yeah. 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 One of his anagrams. Yeah. <laughs> well, uh, that's lovely. Yeah. Isn't it though? Uh, well, uh, yeah. I t uh, th my story ties in too, because again, it's the sea, but it also has a little bit to do with aliens. Okay. Meaningless stuff. Why do we gift so much meaningless stuff? Tired of generic gifts and hollow trends? Shutterfly allows you to create meaningful photo gifts for your family and friends. Whether it's a cozy fleece blanket for grandma, a stunning canvas print for mom, or a mug to make dad smile. Enjoy 40% off with code MAKE40 at Shutterfly.com and make something meaningful this year. See site for more details. If humankind were to meet extraterrestrials, the first hurdle would probably be communication. Something not from Earth is not guaranteed to have any similar biology as a human and may well communicate in a way that completely differs than anything on the planet. When we see these movies about, you know, aliens and stuff, they're always almost always humanoid or they have some sort of they're similar to something on Earth. You know, there's aliens that look like bugs or aliens that, you know, they've, they've got two arms and two legs and a head and, and two eyes. But there's no real reason that that should be the case. They could be, they could look like absolutely anything. They could mm -hmm. be from a place where they, their mouth is just used for eating and not used for talking. 
they might come from a place where there's no oxygen, so they don't, they can't make sounds with their chests and their mouth. They may not have lungs. There's all kinds of reasons that they wouldn't just be able to like, hey, how's it going? You know, it wouldn't be like in Stargate or something where for some reason all the aliens speak English and have British accents. Like that's probably not going to be the case. Really? Are you sure? Cause... They'll probably all have British accents. <laughs> that's, that's actually, that's probably pretty accurate. Well, in 1958, a guy named John Lilly had ideas about communications with aliens that were published in the American Journal of Psychiatry. He basically believed that if we can't communicate with other intelligent life on this planet, how are we going to do it with something that's not on this planet? So, you know, dolphins are pretty fucking smart critters, and we can't communicate with dolphins, so it's going to be rough to communicate with aliens. I don't uh, know. His... I'm pretty sure that kid from Flipper knew what Flipper was saying. I think so, too. Which is funny, because Flipper actually comes into play here. Not yet, Does but he? it will. Oh, I love Flipper. A quote from Lily. Quote, Before our man in space program becomes too successful, it may be wise to spend some time, talent, and money on research with the dolphins, which may be a group with whom we can learn basic techniques communicating with really alien intelligent life forms. Unquote. Lily wrote, Quote, I personally hope we do not encounter any such extraterrestrials before we get better prepared than we are now, unquote. That was from 1958, so we hadn't even put anyone in space yet at that point, and this guy was thinking about that. Three years after that, a group of ten men got together at what was called the Green Bank Conference to talk about the future of the search for aliens. The guest list included a little name like Carl Sagan, who was quite young at the time. He was in his 20s, I believe. A guy named Barney Oliver, who is the director of Hewlett Packard Laboratories. Su Xu Huang, which is an, the astrophysicist who coined the term habitable zone, which is, you know, Earth is a habitable zone. So it's For a now. zone that's habitable. Yeah. <laughs> the chemist Melvin Calvin, who got word during the conference that he won the Nobel Prize. So he is not, you know, he's, he's a he's pretty no fancy dummy. dude. Yeah. He's no dummy. There was the guy who put the group together. He was called Frank Drake. Drake had been involved with Project Ozma, which was a search for extraterrestrials using the radio telescope at Green Bank Observatory in West Virginia, which is also where this conference took place. He pointed the telescope at two sun-like stars about 11 light years away from Earth called Teuseti and Epsilon Ariandi. Eridani, and listened for sounds of intelligence. So with radio telescopes, they would generally listen to just what space sounds like. Well, this was the first time they were actually looking for intelligent life in space. Uh, the project Ozma only lasted three months and didn't, didn't yield anything. They didn't, they didn't find shit. The guy that had requested the conference was the Space Science Board Officer of the National Academy of Sciences, J. Peter Perman. When Drake dropped off the guest list to Pearman, he made some joke about, man, now all we need is someone who has actually spoken with extraterrestrials. Well, Pearman took the joke pretty seriously and said, well, why don't we invite John Lilly? Because, you know, his research at the time was kind of fringe, but it was fascinating. So they're like, sure, let's, let's bring this guy in. As it turned out, Lilly ended up being the life of the conference. Everybody was super interested in what he had to say about communication with non-human life forms. Lily spoke extensively about how dolphins' brains are larger than our own and are just as densely packed with neurons as a human brain. And he believed that the sounds made by dolphins are actually a complicated language that, was, that he was just scratching the surface of. All of these brilliant-ass motherfuckers were so impressed and interested in Lily's research that they actually gave themselves a name, their little group of friends. They, they got a name. They called themselves the Order of the Dolphin. Oh, wow. Yeah. A few months after the conference, John Lilly published his paper on dolphin communication, which ended up being the foundation of dolphin communication research. Because people, people still are inter interested in how dolphins speak to one another. And uh, they basically read his paper first. 
All of his early failures were out there for everyone to see, as well as his penchant for vivisecting his dolphin subjects. Oh. Vivisecting is doing surgery on a living organism for experimental purposes. This isn't to fix anything. This is just to check out how the critter works while it's still alive. They're normally euthanized after the procedure, though they're, they are usually anesthetized too. And it's not just, I mean, people do this with frogs all the time for dissecting a frog. They'll mm-hmm. just chloroform it, throw it on a table, and you'll cut the fucking living thing open so you can see its little heart beating and shit. I think yeah, it's like abs- an E.T. Yeah, I think, it's, I think it's super fucked up and absolutely horrendous. Uh, there's a lot of laws regarding that. You can't just do that. It's got to be, I mean, you got to have a really good reason for it. Unfortunately, that really good reason is sometimes just for high school kids to hack open a critter. Yeah. I like frogs. I like dolphins more. And oh, it's yeah. Horrible. I mean, it's absolutely horrible. And, like, despite all of that, he didn't have any trouble finding funding from the government orga- organizations, including NASA. And at least he was honest about everything. So at least he freely published that he did this. And so it's fucked up. It was a different time. Um, I love dolphins. I love cutting them open while they're alive. Right. Well, that's how much I things love get them. weird with the dolphins. So one night, John Lilly went to some Hollywood party where he met Ivan Tours. Does that name ring a bell? No. Yeah, it didn't to me either. He was the producer of the show Flipper. Oh, okay. And that was a show about a helpful dolphin that basically a sea mammal lassie. Yeah. Tors gave Lily some acid. And the rest was history. Lily went from lab coat to full bone hippie faster than you can say the Grateful Dead. He started taking hallucinogens like mad. And it eventually found his way into his work. So, starting in about 1964, Lily started giving LSD to dolphins to see how they communicated while tripping. As it turns out, dolphins talk a lot more when they're on acid. A dolphin talking is measured in what they call a duty cycle. Okay. Duty cycle is the percentage of time they spend making noise in a one-minute period. When dolphins are just chilling out, not taking drugs, they range between 0 to 70% duty cycle. When tripping, the duty cycle rarely drops to 0%, but when tripping with another dolphin or with a person, they would average a 70% duty cycle for up to three hours. So basically, when dolphins trip, they get super chatty. Uh, When hanging out with other dolphins or a human while sober, they average at at about a 10% duty cycle. So they talk less to other dolphins or people when they're not on drugs. There's a story of a dolphin that had been abused by its previous owner, or as I like to call him, captor. Normally, this dolphin would stay away from Lily. like his his previous the, the the person who had the dolphin before like shot him with a spear gun or some shit like that, Aww. and so the dolphin was, in, I mean he was a kind of afraid of people, which is, I would be too, so right. normally the dolphin would stay away from Lily about twenty feet at the closest is what is is, is how close the dolphin would get. Well, about forty minutes after being injected with LSD, the dolphin swam over to about five feet from John Lilly, and then just popped an eye out of water, remained still, and just stared at him in the eye for about 10 minutes. At one point, he waterproofed his laboratory and filled it with some water so that his assistant, Margaret Howell Lovett, could cohabitate with the dolphins. What he would do is, you know, he waterproofed it and put a couple feet of water in there, and so the dolphin was able to dolphin his way around, and she could hang out. She didn't want to leave a bunch because she felt like always all this leaving and coming back was disrupting what they're trying to do. They're trying to teach these dolphins English. Uh, She actually was not a scientist. She was just called in to do some help. And then she ended up being super good at it. So like, all right, well help us out more, be a research assistant. Obviously, as one can expect, trying to teach an animal English was pretty slow going, pretty tedious work. Uh, The dolphins she was working with were called Sissy, Pamela, and Peter. So Peter would hang out in the lab with her for six days a week. And then for the seventh day, he would go into the enclosure with Sissy and Pamela. And I I, I imagine that they were trying to do that to see if maybe 
when he went back to his own kind, he'd like try to teach them English or something, or maybe dolphins just get sad when they're not with other dolphins. I don't know. Feel your max with Brooks Running and the all new Ghost Max 2. They're the shoes you deserve, designed to streamline your stride and help protect your body. Treat yourself to feel good landings on an ultra high stack of super comfy nitrogen infused cushion that takes the edge off every step, every day. The Brooks Ghost Max 2. You know, technically, they're a form of self care. Brooks, let's run there. Head to brooksrunning.com to learn more. Peter was an adolescent dolphin, and as he grew, he became interested in Lovett. At first, he'd just stare at her. And then he'd start rubbing his, well, Peter, on her hand, her foot, her leg. And so, at first, she was not super cool with this. She would just, you know, get the dolphin into the enclosure, let him calm down or do whatever. And then she'd bring him back up. But that was a real pain in the ass to have to do this every time the dolphin got horny. So she didn't want to spend time away from the dolphin, so she just started to give the dolphin hand jobs. What? Yes. She would jack the dolphin off. Wow. And um, she said it wasn't sexual for her, but it was definitely sensual. Ah, uh, I don't even have the words right now. And this is, I mean, this is through her admission. This isn't just some hearsay bullshit. This is through her admission. As one could expect, their bond became quite a bit stronger between her and the dolphin. She claims it was because it wasn't so much the sexual gratification, but it was that she could spend more time continuing to teach Peter. Dude, all I can hear now is like Chef's voice singing in my head from South Park. Yeah. Yeah, <laughs> dolphin balls. Yeah. Um, which are probably salty. So that's, that's strange. The facility that they were doing all this research in was on the Caribbean Sea. And <laughs> Lily was still eating tons of acid. He actually made a, uh, uh, sensor, an isolation chamber in his lab where he would just pump in water from the Caribbean Sea. And he would just take hella acid and just hang out floating in the dark, just a sensory deprivation chamber. I'm actually pretty sure that he invented sensory deprivation chambers could be and uh so he wasn't making much progress obviously uh love it was like dude stop giving the dolphins acid and like if you want to eat acid that's fine but like do it on your own time don't bring it in here uh they had carl sagan out and he what did was, Carl Sagan say? I'm well. He I, he didn't. I don't know if he said anything about. It. I don't know if they told him about the the whole giving the dolphins the hand job thing. But he was there scratching the belly of one of the dolphins, and he stopped. And the dolphin popped up and sounded like it said more. And so he was like, "Holy shit, Lily! I'm pretty sure one of these dolphins just said more after I stopped scratching its belly." And Lily was like, "Oh yeah." That one knows tons of, like, dozens of English words, and Sagan didn't really believe him. Uh, with no progress, the funding pretty much dried up, and uh, Lily had to go back to his Miami lab with his dolphins. Uh, Lovett stayed behind at that facility and ended up marrying a photographer that was photographing the dolphins. I don't know if he was photographing the dolphins while he, she was pleasuring them, but she married that guy and whatever. Peter committed suicide. Peter was sad. Peter lost his girlfriend, and he didn't know why, and he committed suicide. How did Dolph he do that? Uh, dolphins have to consciously breathe. Unlike us, where we just breathe, dolphins have to think about it. And so he took a breath, breathed out, sank to the bottom of the tank, and died. Oh my god, that's awful. It's so sad. So It's so fucked up. The dolphin... <laughs> committed suicide because he was heartbroken. This is the whole thing is super fucked up. Super fucked up. Somebody was giving these people like thousands of dollars to basically just sit around in their water lab tripping balls. No, it was just dolphins. Lily and the dolphins that were tripping. It wasn't love it. She never I don't but I don't believe she took any acid. 
Yeah, but still, it's like, okay, this guy's just sitting there dosing, like, macro-dosing, basically. Yeah. Oh, yeah. And dosing up all the dolphins, and then she's just hanging out and giving one of them hand jobs until it gets so attached to her that it fucking kills itself when they run out of money because they're... <laughs> Jacking off dolphins and taking a bunch of acid. People are probably tired of, like, funding, you know, a bunch of, like, acid trips and dolphin jerk-off sessions. And, yeah, I mean, oh my god! This guy took so much acid that Timothy Leary would come hang out. Like, this guy was taking acid. Like, lots and lots of acid. I'm surprised he wasn't hanging out with the Beach Boys or something, you know? This guy was on the fucking drugs. No, people are still doing research on on dolphins talking to dolphins, less with the acid and hand jobs. Yeah, let's hope so. Yeah, and uh, they found a lot of interesting things. Uh, There's a way to calculate how people talk, and it's called like the, I think it was the, like the Zift method or the Zift hypothesis or something. And dolphins, when they are saying, making single sounds, have it's the same level of complexity that humans have when they're talking. However, human speech gets way more complicated. All of this shit was done for SETI, this, you know, the search for extraterrestrial intelligence, because they wanted to be able to talk to aliens before they ran into aliens. And it just went fucking bonkers. Uh, yeah, just a little bit. Yeah, yeah. So that's 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 my story of dolphins on LSD, and it got—I okay. mean, it, it really, it really, really got away from from me there. It's, yeah, just a little bit. It's Dude, fucking crazy. Human beings are just trash, and need to just like leave dolphins alone. Yeah. So long, and thanks for all the fish. Mm-hmm. Where I ran across this is I heard on some podcast about how dolphins are kind of like aliens, and I'm like, oh yeah. Because you look at the gray aliens, and a lot of dolphins are gray, and they got the big black eyes, and the gray aliens have the big black eyes. And we know that whales used to walk on land. They went from water to land back to water. You know, they found that skeleton of the of the ancient whale that I talked about last time. Right. Well, and, you know, and then there's Star Trek Four Voyage Home. I mean, oh, it's yeah. fiction, but it, it kind of makes sense. You know, there's that whole probe that could only be answered by the whale song. Yeah, man. Yeah, so, that alien thing that looked like that thing that was that, that was yeah. out in outer space recently. <laughs> right, yeah. So this thing, uh, yeah, that uh, Oumuamua. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, so this, uh, I mean, it started out me trying to find out, like, information about whether, like, Dolphins and gray aliens could be, you know, cousins or something. Mm-hmm. And it turned out that humans liked to dose dolphins and give them hand jobs. It would not shock me if dolphins know more about aliens than we do. Oh, it wouldn't shock me either. Yeah. And these were all bottlenose dolphins that he was working with. Uh, the guy, Lily, I believe he died in 2001. So that's a wild story. That is a wild story. <laughs> yeah. Sad as fuck. So sad. That is so sad. Obviously, these creatures are very intelligent if they're able to do that. I mean, lemmings commit suicide, sure, but it's not a intentional thing. They're not thinking about it. They're not doing it for a reason. It's just overpopulation. Here we go. It's not, yeah. man, I miss this fucking person. Right. It's just, it's just sad. Uh, have you seen the show on Netflix, My Octopus Teacher? No, I've seen um, previews for it. You should 100% watch that. All the listeners, you should 100% watch that. It's very, very wholesome. It's also sad, but in a wholesome way. Um, The guy never gave the octopus a hand job. Okay. So it's child friendly. A really good, a really good show. It's I think like an hour and a half long or something. Absolutely brilliant. Um. Shows how absolutely intelligent octopuses are. Honestly, if you like to uh, eat octopuses, then don't watch this because you won't want to eat them afterwards because they are clearly very intelligent animals. Uh, I would be, I don't even want to call them animals. They're so intelligent. Right. And I'm sure it's the same wow. with dolphins. I mean, they're, they're sentient life forms. I mean. Well, it's like pigs too. Pigs have like 
very high intelligence. And I don't eat fucking pigs either. Yeah, you don't. Yeah. I, I, I do. Just, just bacon. But they, they taste so smart. <laughs> <laughs> I don't eat dolphin, though. No, not, not on purpose. And I wouldn't eat octopus. I eat squid, but I don't think squid, they're... I don't, I don't think squid are very smart, though. I think they're just, like, fucking mean. Yeah. Like the giant ones, at least. Yeah, yeah. You know, you don't want to run across them if you're no. in a boat. Mm-mm. Or or if you're swimming or whatever. Yeah, just at all. No. Unless they're deep fried on your platter. Calamari. Mm, yes. That's yum, right. yum, yum. Well, I think that has about will about do it for us today. So thank you very much for listening. As you know, you can find us at any of the social media sites that we are actually at. Stranger Than or Stranger Than Podcast. You can find us at the podcast syndicate we're a part of, Age of Radio. You find us at ageofradio.org slash Stranger Than, where you can listen to our episodes there. You can join our Patreon, patreon.com slash Stranger Than Podcast. And for $1, you'll get a crisp high five if you ever meet us. For $2, you get ad-free episodes, like regular episodes. And for $5 a month, you get a bonus true crime episode. We actually have a new Patreon subscriber, Aaron. Thank you very much, Aaron, for your patronizing. For, yeah, for your patronage. <laughs> uh, we appreciate it. And uh, I think with that, we will talk to you next time. And stay strange. <laughs> <laughs>